So I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me and for giving me the opportunity to speak here. I'm, I'm quite happy. So the, what I'm going to be talking about essentially is particles. But I don't want to describe each one of them because that would be quite costly for systems which has a lot uh, of particles. So the point of view that I'm going to be taking it will be, perhaps unsurprisingly in this type of conference, to somehow describe them via continuous descriptors, which for us will be just solutions of SPDs. And so just to set some, some reference in terms of uh, notation, I'll always be denoting by, um, by nu, the particle density, which will contain the truth and the, the entire information that we somehow don't want to describe uh, in fullness. And then we'll have rho, which will be the continuous descriptor, so something which hopefully will approximate the particle density in a fairly faithful way. And not only that, but I'll be interested in deviations from the average profiles of both systems. I'm not interested in what happens on average. That's been answered in the literature for most of for the systems that I will discuss. But I'm interested in what happens in relation to that, so the deviations. And so this uh, goes onto the spectrum of the, the theory of fluctuating hydrodynamics. So many of you will be acquainted with this, um, which essentially takes systems which have a finite number of particles in which each one of them is subject to noise. And the point is not to lose this noise in the translation to continuous models. So the point is to keep it. And usually we go from SDEs to, to SPDs, so adding the spatial component. And <clears throat> for example, these are two uh, references for the, for the theory. And of course, the general picture that once more I want to somehow focus on is I'll have this intermediate point of view between the mean field lim limit, which, will, which does away with the fluctuations and doesn't take them into account. But for us, this will be important regardless because this will be somehow what we will hinge our numerical approximations on. So it will still play a role for us. Uh, but we want to analyze what happens in the middle. And there are many aspects that have appeared in the somehow in recent de decades. There's, there's the question of how to link particles to SPDs by itself. So for, uh, simple, for simple systems, this is now well known. But as this, the particle system grow in complexity and also in relevance, so for example, in machine learning, this question is, is more and more pressing and relevant. Once you have a model that you, that you think does the right job, then you can do something at analyzing it, either uh, analytically or, or numerically. And then you might want to study what happens in, as a deviation from the, the mean field limit. But for this talk, I'll be focusing on just two aspects, uh, numerics and fluctuations. And I'll just take uh, things from the literature concerning the other two. And so the question, why even go to SPDs? Well, given the conference, I will not indulge into that. But why I'm doing this specifically at, at this point is just to gain efficiency. So I just want to simulate things more quickly uh, in the case of having a large number of particles. So this is, for me, the, the driving point. And the specific example I'll be using for the rest of the talk will be known to, uh, to many of you, but if, if not, then I'll recall the, the basic elements of the structure. The model was derived, uh, was named after two uh, scientists that proposed it formally in the late 90s, and essentially says, well, just take, for example, weakly interacting particles, interacting by this um, potential V, which may be as smooth as you want. There's no need for it to be singular at this point. Um, and just take the empirical density, which is the ground truth of the system that we want to consider. And they proposed uh, an SPD for this, which um, has a deterministic component, which is, uh, which is well known. So this kind of no linearity uh, reflects the potential. And there's a Laplace operator, which accounts for the Brownian dynamics. And then there's a, uh, a, div in a noise in divergence form with a specific structure. So the, I don't, there's, for, for me at this point, the domain can be just a torus. And the, the noise here will be space-time. And I'll be, I'll be writing it in this way 
with a L2 orthonormal basis just for practical reasons, because when I do numerics, then this formulation will be quite handy to keep. So I'll choose it to express it in this way. And so this is supposed to be, uh, there's supposed to be a match between the solution of this and the empirical density, which a priori uh, is, not, is not visible. And just a few words about why the noise is like that. The divergence simply preserves the, the mass. So n particles going in the system, they're not lost anywhere. So this is reflected in this way. As for the other two components, these are basically down to making sure that the statistical properties of the, of the two densities are the same. So if you test each one of those, so the, the SPD and the, true, the ground truth, the particles, against test functions, again, as regular as you need, there's no, there's no issue of regularity here with the test functions, then it is possible to prove that the covariance of this pro these two processes have the same structure. So this is, a, is an indication that the two things somehow are uh, well aligned. And they're linear in the density. So this fact has been used um, by many authors in this field uh, at various points. So this somehow justifies the, the, notion, of, the notion of solution in, Mar in a Martingale sense. And the structure boils down to, well, from the particle side, uh, this is a quick computation of the, the noise of the empirical density once it gets tested against the test functions. On the SPD side, this comes down to essentially recovering the linear density uh, through Parseval. So the, the noise being uh, white in space and time means that essentially you end up in a situation in which you, once you have offloaded the original divergence onto the test functions, you're left in a position in which you can integrate out using Parseval. And so this square function goes back into a linear object. This is essentially the reason why the noise was set up in this way. And numerically, this is quite relevant. So the numeris goes through, essentially, this uh, is funneled through this channel. <clears throat> and again, everything is linear in the density. But so the, uh, the, the model was proposed as a, as a descriptor for the particles, and it was proved that it actually is. So uh, subject to the definition of Martingale solution, the two things are exactly equivalent. So the density, the empirical density, uh, is exactly the solution to the SPD. So the model is completely exact. There's no, there's no room for, there's no mistake in making this. It's good. And um, once we have that knowledge, then that, this knowledge can be used by taking a, a step aside from the, from the true model by making it a little bit more regular and then getting a lot of properties out of it. Um, so essentially, the, the, the picture that I always like to show is this ground truth in the middle, which doesn't all, only apply to the, the particle system that I've shown, but also to others, in which one model has been produced, and it's exact. So at that point, you have the freedom to either step into the analytical regularizations and produce a lot of results based on the fact that you're... you're uh, you're studying something which is very close to the particles. But you can also go the other way and n regularize numerically and do the same. So just a list of references for the, for the middle, so for the ground truth. Uh, these are somehow the non-exhaustive list of references um, of authors who deal with exactly linking PDs, uh, SPDs and particles. Then on the right, so analytical regularizations again, there's lots of results concerning uh, large deviation principles, derivation of smooth solutions subject to a minimal tweaking of the equation, ergodicity, uh, and, and many, many things. And on the, on the left, there, there's the, the approach that says taking the SPDs at hand and applying numerical methods to them to see what comes out. And so far, I've seen the, 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 the main elements, uh, finite elements, finite volumes, and finite differences, all have all been applied um, to, the, to the equations. 
And, and the point will be, even though the equation is quite singular, these methods somehow are, there is an, there is an unlikely marriage between the singularity of the SPD and the effectiveness of the numerical methods, which somehow works quite well. I'll be focusing on uh, this case for, for simplicity. And so the point for us will be to, uh, given an SPD model that, that works for, uh, as a descriptor of the fluctuations, we want to discretize. So to, I'm adding an H here as an indication of a discretization in space. And I want to produce a model that somehow does the right job up to a small error. And the first thing that I try is I brutally discretize the equation with finite differences. So I just take everything that you see here, I'm just considering the case without potential. So the potential is not crucial at this point, and we can just neglect it from, from now on. So I just apply finite difference operators uh, on a uniform grid in space. So for each point, these operators will only be uh, seeing uh, a neighborhood. They will reflect the, their, their continuous counterparts. As for the noise, again, I just take what I have in continuous space and I just plug it in in discrete space. So here, each one of these Brownian motions will live, uh, will be associated with a point on the grid. And the only thing that I need to be care careful about is I don't know a priori whether or not the solution will be positive. Usually when you do numerical schemes, positivity is, is quite shaky, so you have to be careful about that. So just for the time being, I just put a plus just to, keep, just to make it safe. But there's no, I mean, the, 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 scre the, um, the scheme is just uh, applying finite differences straight. No, no need to do anything else. And so the point will be to produce, to um, somehow set up the, so the SPD has been set up. What I want to show is that it does a fairly good job at approximating um, somehow um, moments of the fluctuations. So here you have the, particle fluctuations test against the test function, and everything will be computed in terms of moments. So this psi of the outside, you can think of it as moments. So we're characterizing the law of these fluctuations. And uh, the first thing you have to do, you have to make sure that the expected value of this is somehow faithfully represented by your SPD. You first have to get this right, otherwise, uh, uh, I mean, you cannot proceed, really. And uh, once you've done that, so once you have made sure that this thing is, is actually fairly good, uh, then, the, and this is the point of the talk. So this talk, the, the, this talk will be about, once we have this object uh, in place, we would like to come up with some alternative uh, methods to somehow reduce the variance of this as much as possible. Because reducing the variance of this estimator will make sure that we need to simulate less in order to have the same error at the end. This is the, th so this is the target. Um, something briefly about the, the first question, so how to make the two expected values sort of the same. Uh, so how do I get low bias? Uh, the low bias we settled that uh, in earlier works with, uh, with Julian Fischer, uh, Jonas Ingmans, who's a PhD of his at IST, and Claudia Reiter, who's at uh, TU Dresden. And essentially what we say is, okay, we measure the distance of these two kind of fluctuations, so the, the SPD ones or the particle ones, and okay, there is some numerical error that comes up, but we're, de we're doing numerical schemes, so that's there in any case. Then we have a term which is exponentially small in a specific number, which I'll, I'll comment on what this is. And then subject to taking a sufficiently weak metric, then we're allowed somehow to have a residual term that does not interfere with the, with the numerical error. So the equation, so remember that the, the, the Inkazaki equation is, is exact. So it's not, if you take away the numerical error, and everything that you've done on the equation itself, so messing up the grid and everything, you're supposed to be recovering uh, an identity. But essentially, by taking weak metrics, this term 
which uh, is a residual of the, me of the method, somehow goes away. It's an indication that the equation is exact in the, in the limit. But in the language of a, of a numerical analysis, it does not mess with, with this. So this is the only dial that you have to control the method. And so the, but one of the, the, the errors that I had here was this exponential, which is somehow good for us in the sense that uh, the regime in which we want to use the SPD is when we have more particles than grid points. Because that's the, the regime in which the, the SPD is cheaper to simulate than the particles themselves. If we were in the opposite case, then I would, be, I would have no business standing up here and telling you about the, this method. Because at that point, the particles would be cheaper to simulate. And so in the only regime that actually we're interested in, the modeling error that we perform is negligible. So we can, we can somehow do away with it and not worry about it, which is an important thing. And, um, and again, the, this additional term, which is somehow ref reflecting the fact that the SPD is exact, will go away if you make the, the norm in which you measure these fluctuations weaker and weaker. Essentially, you're going beyond the central limit theorem because you, you have an exact object that you can somehow converge to. So essentially, this means that this uh, approximation, so the norm that was set in the, in the previous theorem, reflects uh, the fact that you can do this approximation fairly well. So at least the SPD nails what it has to nail in expected value. But the second question that I have, and this is exactly the, the, the topic of, of the, the talk, is now I want to reduce the variance because I want to make the estimator that I have at hand even uh, more applicable. So I have this random variable which quantifies the, the fluctuations. And somehow, if I just take an average of uh, m independent realizations of this thing, then I will be converging to the expected value, but I will be doing so in a very slow fashion. Remember that these are solutions to SPDs, so sampling an awful lot of them is a pain, so we need to reduce the cost even more. And so the question here is, can I do multi-level? So can I split, can I divide the cost into different levels according to, uh, to a different metric? And the question is, yes. So the idea will be to consider nested grids. So each grid will have a size h, and uh, the grid inside of it will have the half that size. And each one of these grids will have to talk to their adjacent counterparts. And so the, what I want to do, I want to rewrite the, the, the quantity that I'm after as a telescopic sum of uh, some other stuff, which essentially goes back onto, uh, onto each level. With the, with the understanding that if I do that, I should be able to somehow produce an object which has the same variance, but whose cost is dramatically less to, to simulate. This is the point. And in this business, usually everything boils down to making sure that the variance of the estimators on consecutive levels are close enough. So if I can, if I can prove that this is small enough, then this this whole methodology essentially works by, by design. So it's a, it's, a, it's a known machinery. And the natural thing to do to define these uh, um, auxiliary quantities will just be to say, OK, PL is just whatever I want on grid L with no change whatsoever in definition. There's no need to do anything else. So the grid that I'll, that I'll be working on is coarse or fine, depending on L. There, there, there is also a time discretization in, in, the, in the paper, but for simplicity and for notational reasons, I will not mention any of this. So HL will, L will refer to both time and space. But so let's get to why this is somehow supposed to be small. So how do I make this small? I make it small if I couple, if I need to couple the, two, the levels L and L minus 1. And for doing this, I need to work on the, on the noise itself. So in terms of distribution, the noise is just a white noise on each, uh, on each grid. But for this to work, I need to make sure that on consecutive grids, 
the noises are as close to each other as I could possibly make them to. So this means that, for example, in this sort of nearest neighbors coupling, uh, this purple point from the coarse grid, the, the, the randomness that I find there, so the random motion that sits there, is somehow being produced by summing up whatever the random motions are at the neighboring site from the, the, the finer uh, discretization. So if I sum them up, uh, I will have recovered the Brownian motion, so subject to scaling, but these two things will be quite close to each other. And I'm using, for at this point, these hat func functions that basically are um, discrete Dirac deltas at each point. But I can also work in Fourier, in Fourier space, so I can just do, okay, I don't want to focus on, on this. I can also take a grid now in frequencies, and I say, okay, the coupling now works in the following way. So the small grid will somehow give all of its Brownian motions to the, the bigger grid. And so they will coincide, uh, not just statistically, but pathwise on the small grid. So these are two ways to, to couple things, and this will be associated with having a trigonometric basis. And so for the sake of argument, I will just conclude the talk by focusing on just one of these, so the nearest neighbors. Uh, there's been, there will be no interaction between particles, so I've, I've, I've forgotten about the potential 20 minutes ago, and I intend to keep doing that. And then the time discretization, there is time discretization in this business, but I'm just hiding it for the purpose of not messing notation up too much. So the... The thing that we, have to, that we need to provide, basically, to close this off is this various variance bound. And this various bound has two objects in it. So it has a, the inverse average number of particles. So this is an object that somehow we can control and which makes the SPD good or bad. And the numerical error, which is always there. So there's a competition here between how singular the SPD is, essentially, and how, and how much numerical error I'm allowed to deal with. And this, this, this interplay is, is present in these kind of um, SPDs. And the reason why these two terms appear, so the, the main idea behind proving this, is we need to somehow link the two densities, the two SPD solutions at consecutive levels. And in order to do this, it's just easier to go through the mean field limits, because these don't have any noise in them. So the, the first step is to use the coupling. So the coupling will allow not to just consider this chain in, in, a, in abstraction, but actually to just focus on near, near on neighboring points in the grid. So it, using the coupling essentially means you can just look at neighboring points. Neighboring points in, in a numerical analysis means that the difference of functions of, that, of those points will be small. That's, that's what the coupling will give you. Then you do, okay, the, um, the mean field limits are essentially discrete heat equations. And ever since the beginning of time, these bounds have been known. So we're, I'm just dealing with a discrete heat equation on a torus with finite differences. So it, it, as, a PD, as PDs go, it's just fine. So the numerical error here for doing this step, so for crossing levels, is small because you're you're linking it to the, to the continuous uh, the, um, heat equation. What's more difficult is to do the fluctuation. So once you, uh, you have the mean field limit, you want to include the noise, and you want to measure how, how big the noise is at each point. So you need an L infinity bound for the noise. But for this, um, the way we do this is I test the difference of the mean field limit and the solution with a discrete uh, Dirac delta, because that will identify the value that I'm interested in. Then uh, I will choose a test function, which is somehow the time reversed mean field limit, in order to get rid of everything that I don't need and just leave me with the one object that I will be needing, which is somehow giving me the size of the noise, so how big the noise is at that point. So I'll now substantiate in, in formulas what these points are. So the trick here is just to take a Dirac delta located at the point in which I want to produce the estimate, 
and then going backwards with the, with the heat, with the discrete heat. The discrete heat will somehow clash with the heat from the, from the true SPD, and they will cancel out. And canceling out, the only thing that, which, that will be left will be the covariance of the noise, which in this business is always what you, what you want to, to somehow uh, see appearing at the end of your computations, because that's the thing that you want to use, and it's easy to use. Essentially, if I compute the moment alpha of this quantity, then I will go down by two orders by Ito, and I'll have the, um, the covariance structure appear. So remember that the Dean-Kawasaki equation has this type of covariance structure, which is linear in the density. Here we just have a plus because we're doing numeric, so we might need to be careful. But once I'm here, I just need to quantify how big this thing is, because this kind of thing suggests that I, I can get essentially Gaussian type moments because I can do this for every alpha. So subject to a lot of details that I want, don't want to talk about right now, the, the, the only thing that one has to do is determine how big this is. And determining how big this is, well, you have this gradient of the test function which comes from the fact that the, the original equation had a divergence in it. But if you integrate this out in time, then you can somehow do away with not having this gradient. So you, you go back just to essentially to the L2 norm of your Dirac delta that you started from. But so this is a good scaling because this h to the minus d is paired with this n minus 1, which is the size of the noise as it, as it as it's always been, that gives you this quantity, which is the inverse on the uh, average number of particles, which is something that you, it's the, the relevant thing that for you to, to work with. And so this somehow justification, this justifies modulo extra details that are not important at this point. Ah, so, so said differently, yes, you can remove the divergence from the scaling by integrating in time this this test function, so this heat equation that somehow ends up in this Dirac delta. But so you have managed to, for each fixed point, you have managed to compare, compare the mean field limit with the SPD uh, with these kind of quantities, which are fine. And so if you put everything together, then you recover exactly these two terms. So this coming from the mean field limit and this coming from the size of the noise. And again, these two compete with each other, but this one is supposed to be small for the model even to be, to be usable. And this somehow implies that if you feed that in into the Monte Carlo business, it essentially implies that the, you can gain a, a substantial factor between just doing straight Monte Carlo with no, get, no nested grids uh, against doing Monte, Monte level Monte Carlo, so with these grids one inside of the other, and the cost somehow goes up with the particle density, and this is a thing that it's nice to have. There's a, there's a geometrical limitation of the space, which is the, the volume factor. So it appears that at least it's difficult to exceed the, the inverse of the unit cell. But this, this has nothing to do with the equation. I guess it's just, I don't know, maybe the, the geometry of the space. And somehow the... Again, what we go down to is this number here determining whether the SPD is usable or not. So in the regime in which the, the particle density is low, the particles are more competitive. So who cares about the SPD, essentially? If you are in a, in a high density, then the SPD performs really well. But you also get to have a transition between the SPD being shit to the SPD being good. And you can still gain substantially even along that way. And I'll now give you some simulations that basically point to this fact. So here is a, the discrete mean field limit, so this is just the heat equation. And this is a solution of the SPD for a fairly large value of H in which you don't really see the fluctuations. And if you get to a smaller value of H, then you start seeing these tiny dots appearing because the SPD is trying to mimic a sum of uh, Dirac deltas, so it's trying to recover uh, spikes. 
And this is even more visible from a 3D plot in which for, for large H, there's basically nothing going on. But then you have like this heat equation hodge, uh, hedgehog effect, so in which you have spikes which begin to appear. Uh, remember, you will never be able to perform the limit h going to zero because at that point, the singularity will kill everything. But you don't need to because h going to zero corresponds to the fact that at some point, the particles will be less expensive to use. So there's really no need to do that. And this is one of the cases in which the, the density is pretty, pretty high. So you have a, a quadratic decay for this variance of difference of levels, which is what we proved. And this is a, in, in the, the cost, so the, the cost reduction between the two methods going up, essentially, uh, in an ideal way. And this corresponds to, not, to us being here, more or less. There's also the, the other case in which the, the SPD is not, I mean, there is more than one particle per cell, so the SPD still wins, but it's not as effective as it could be, so it's, it's somewhere in the middle. So at some point, the estimate will break down, but you still, you have gained quite a lot already, so if you get here. And this will correspond to us being somewhere here between value one and this object, which somehow it's the, it's the threshold after which the SPD performs at its best. But still, you, you gain something. So the, the morale here, yes, the, the, the SPD is singular. And yes, numerical discretizations seem to work fairly well with no, adap adap no particular adaptation. So the, the, the method itself is a finer difference which just is just applied on the thing. And then, of course, you have to prove bounds, but it seems that the, these two worlds are, coexist quite peacefully. And uh, what I've been talking about is essentially, so the first two references were uh, related to uh, what this is built on, so having a low bias for moments uh, and this third work is where we actually do this multi-level uh, somehow uh, structure. Uh, and I think, yeah, I think I'm, I'm done. I'd like to thank you for your attention.